Good afternoon and welcome to Osler's webinar series, Best Practices for the Legal Department of Tomorrow. I'm Evan Bars. I'm an associate in Osler's Litigation Department in Toronto. This is the fourth in a series of webinars that Osler is presenting on how your in-house legal team can position itself for success in this ever-changing legal landscape. In today's webinar, we will be discussing best practices for in-house counsel to address the legal risks and issues associated with social media. I'm joined today by Sven Poiza, a partner in Osler's Employment and Labour Group with significant experience in all areas of employment and labour law and Sonia Pavic, an associate in Osler's litigation department with a practice focused on risk management and crisis response, regulatory and, and internal investigations and class actions, and Evan Thomas, an associate in Osler's litigation group with a practice that includes cases involving technology and data, such as disputes involving data licensing, privacy, data security, IT projects, online defamation, and the protection of confidential information. If you have any questions during the webinar, please email us or type them into the area provided on your screen and we will respond to them as soon as time permits. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sven, Sonia and Evan. Thanks Evan and welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, in today's webinar, we're going to cover the key aspects of social media risk that we think are most relevant to you as in-house counsel. First, um, my colleague Evan Thomas will provide an overview of various social media risks and the potential legal responses to issues that may arise. I will then discuss the roles of the legal team versus public relations consultants and how to coordinate between the two. My colleague Sven will then discuss social media and the employment relationship, including best practices for social media policy. To set the stage, we all know that social media is pervasive. It has changed the way people communicate, exchange information, and do business. The prevalence of social media comes with a whole host of risks and considerations, including legal risks, reputational risks, and HR and employment issues. And when we talk about social media risks or crises today, we are really referring to a broad range of situations that generally fall into two buckets. First, there's social media that can trigger a crisis situation, such as if a company posts a tweet that goes horribly wrong and has major media backlash. Or social media can amplify a crisis. An, exam an example of that could be where an issue is made public through a news release or a whistleblower report, and then social media becomes the catalyst for a broader public reaction. With that backdrop in mind, I will turn it over to my colleague, Evan Thomas, to talk about some of the legal risks. Thanks, Sonia. So it's important to remember when talking about social media risks that um, the risks around marketing and advertising uh, have always existed. Because marketing and advertising are essential aspects of, of many businesses, but particularly consumer businesses. So what I'm going to be focusing on is about how the use of social media to advertise or market a business or brand uh, or to uh, otherwise engage with uh, customers or others can create new or different legal risks that in-house counsel need to consider. And these, these risks, they arise from certain unique aspects of social media as compared uh, to more traditional forms of advertising or marketing or customer engagement, such as print or TV advertising. So first of all, social media moves fast. It moves extremely quickly, uh, essentially in real time. It's also a dialogue with consumers. Unlike TV or print, it's more of a one-way communication with customers about the brand or the product, social media lends itself to an ongoing conversation uh, with customers, with customers responding to the brand and the brand responding uh, to the customer. Thirdly, customers expect social media to be authentic and organic and they're very alive to where uh, social media, a uh, social media presence is inauthentic or fake. So these particular features of social media, which uh, are in many ways uh, its strengths, they also uh, create certain risks. And the first of these that I'm going to talk about is the risk associated with misleading influencer advertising. So 
Now, of course, traditional advertising has always had celebrity endorsements. We've all seen TV and print ads with a celebrity endorsing a particular product or brand. Now, online, on social media, uh, consumers will routinely follow online personalities. And these personalities, they are important sources of information for consumers. They provide product reviews. They provide recommendations. They demonstrate how products can be used. And their insights and information into products can influence the purchasing decisions of these interested consumers. They are their influencers. And unlike more traditional media, they can range from otherwise private individuals who might have a following of hundreds, maybe thousands of followers, to global celebrities whose audience is counted in the millions. And so advertisers are prepared to pay or otherwise compensate influencers to create and share content that features their products or brands. This might be a blogger who reviews a, a product or a service or Perhaps it's an athlete who mentions a, a dietary choice or a fashion and lifestyle person who posts content featuring clothing. So now, these influencers, they can be paid sometimes quite significant amounts of money or other compensation to post content that helps promote a brand. This is influencer marketing. And this is an increasingly essential part of social media marketing strategies. And so, of course, the issue for in-house counsel is how can your organization maximize the benefit of this new means of reaching consumers without accepting an undue increase in the level of risk. And there, one of the risks that arises is that when dealing with a third party that has, its, has his or her own brand, there is a risk if that person is using their influence to promote or otherwise benefit your product or brand on the basis of compensation, and that relationship is not being disclosed to the consumer. That creates the risk that the influencer's efforts on your behalf, on behalf of your brand or your product, are misleading or otherwise deceiving consumers into believing something that is not true. And in fact, the Canadian Competition Bureau has issued a policy on influencer marketing that makes precisely this point. So the issue for general counsel and, and external counsel is how to advise on these influencer partnerships and how to advise in particular on how they should be disclosed to consumers in a way that's mitigating this risk of misleading consumers but without negatively affecting or at least un negatively, unduly negatively affecting the authenticity and the impartiality that is the value of influencer marketing. So, on a somewhat related note, a related risk, which is uh, using the names and likenesses of influential people to promote a brand, but without, without such a partnership, without consent. And this risk arises because social media moves fast. This, this is part of the appeal of, of social media. Consumers like that brands uh, are, and products are uh, reacting and engaging with them on a real-time basis. It's often those in charge of social media marketing feeds want to capitalize quickly on fortuitous developments in an effort to boost the exposure of the brand. And so a natural example would be a celebrity using the product or otherwise being associated with the brand. That's something that a social media marketing manager may want to capitalize on and use this organic boost to the brand by making sure people know about it. But of course, the risk is that using someone's name or likeness without their consent is something that may be actionable. And indeed, this has happened. There was a drugstore chain in the, in the US that tweeted a photo of a celebrity uh, who visited one of the stores. And she promptly turned around and sued them for using her name and photo without consent. Now, stepping back, you might question well, how could this possibly happen? Because we would never think, no, re, no responsible organization would ever think of using a celebrity's name or picture when running a TV or print ad without 
uh, getting that uh, celebrities or frankly any individuals uh, consent before doing so. But this, this illustrates the broader risk of the fast moving nature of social media. That those in charge of your company's social media presence, they want to move quickly, they want to use the organic and fast moving nature of social media to maximum benefit, but they don't always appreciate the risks and they don't always take the time to seek legal advice. So here, uh, uh, there is a role for in-house and external counsel in addressing, addressing this risk through whether there's policies or other training for those in charge of social uh, media marketing so that they are aware of these risks and so they have guidelines uh, for mitigating those risks and so that they know to seek advice where appropriate. Another example of where the use of social media marketing may create a risk of deceptive or misleading advertising is the use of astroturfing. So what is meant by this? Now, of course, customers often rely on online reviews, whether it's on social media or elsewhere on the internet, when making pur purchasing decisions. And it may be that marketing uh, teams may be tempted to encourage employees of the organization to post positive reviews online, or they might even pay third parties to do so, to effectively act as satisfied customers and post positive reviews about their experience with the product or brand. This is called astroturfing. And it gets this name because it's not real grass, it's not real grassroots. But from a legal perspective, it creates a significant risk of charges of misleading or deceptive advertising. And in fact, there has, this has been the subject of a consent settlement between the Canadian Competition Bureau and a major telecommunications company where almost exactly this happened. Certain employees were encouraged to post positive reviews and ratings of mobile apps without disclosing that they were employees of the company that was making the apps available. So now to its credit, when the company became aware of what had taken place, it immediately took steps to have the reviews and ratings removed and it fully cooperated with the Competition Bureau. But nonetheless, it ultimately entered into a consent agreement with the Bureau under which it agreed to enhance its compliance program to prohibit this kind of astroturfing activity and it also agreed to pay a $1.25 million penalty which uh, demonstrates the magnitude of the risk even where this kind of conduct is inadvertent and unknown to senior management of the organization. Now one of the advantages of social media that I mentioned earlier was the ability to have a dialogue with customers. And indeed this is something that customers really like. It allows them to have a conversation effectively in real time with the company or the brand. And again, this contrasts with the one-way uh, nature of traditional advertising. And sometimes customers uh, with issues, they can receive answers to questions or have their issues dealt with faster uh, than if they go through more conventional customer service uh, channels such as, uh, such as the telephone. But your company needs to remember that these conversations that are playing out on social media, this engagement that is happening on social media, it's happening in public. It's visible uh, in, in most cases to others. Now, this is not necessarily a negative thing in and of itself. This can be ha helpful from a brand and customer relationship perspective because sometimes a discussion with one customer about an issue will be helpful to other customers as well. And it also helps to show just how engaged the brand is with its customers. But at the same time, it creates a legal risk of a violation of privacy laws to the extent that that conversation and the company side of that conversation is disclosing personal information about the customer without the customer's consent. So here, uh, the, the way to address this risk is to ensure that social media managers are aware of the risk, that there are policies and training in place to know when it's appropriate to take a dialogue, a conversation with a customer offline into private, avoiding the public discussions that create the risk of an inadvertent disclosure of private information. 
Now, social media, of course, is about enhancing the brand, and an important part of any brand are the trademarks associated with it. Now, unfortunately, uh, social media, uh, in a way, enhances the ability of others to, mis uh, to, submit to misuse trademarks, uh, trademarks or otherwise uh, inf uh, affect the goodwill that companies have built in their brands. And of course, companies, particularly in the, in the social media world, have to be careful to protect their brands and trademarks uh, because of the risk that if they do not, they may lose the legal rights that they have in their trademarks and the goodwill that they have in their brands. So examples could be companies using, uh, other companies rather, using uh, your logos or trademarks in their own advertising on social media. It could be social media users registering account names or creating pages that incorporate your trademarks. And added to this uh, increased opportunity for your trademarks to be uh, misused or infringed upon is that enforcement is difficult because sometimes it's very difficult to identify who is the person behind the misuse or infringement because they're either operating anonymously or they're operating on some, under some sort of pseudonym. And finding out their true identity uh, can be a challenge that may require uh, legal action of its own. Now here, the, uh, the, the, many social media platforms ha do have their own appropriate use policies and they have processes for stopping the infringement of intellectual property rights, including but not limited to trademarks. So here there are avenues independent of legal action that can be used to assist in the protection of your company's trademarks. So again here, the, uh, the need here is for in-house counsel to be cognizant of these risks and the potential enhancement of these risks in the social media sphere, but also to be avail uh, aware of the available remedies which extend beyond uh, potential litigation um, uh, for the purposes of protecting trademarks and brands. Now, part of the engagement that is part of social media means giving customers a platform to communicate their views publicly. Now hopefully, and indeed for the most part, customers are responsible in the use of that platform. And to the extent they're using your brand's page uh, or website to post comments or other feedback, they're doing so in a responsible manner. But the risk here is that individuals can use the social media presence maintained by your company to post defamatory, abusive, private, confidential, or copyrighted content. And as the operator of that forum, as a maintainer of that, pa uh, that page, the risk here is that your company may become liable for republishing that content. And that risk may be enhanced if your company is taking an active role in May, uh, in moderating the content, is making decisions about what content is appropriate and what is not, and taking it down. Because this tends to demonstrate that you are in control of the page or the website or other social media presence. And of course, at the same time, taking down anything from your social media presence creates uh, the more reputational risk of accusations of engaging in censorship. So now the issues here are uh, complex. They're going to depend on the nature of the content and the applicable uh, legal regime. But at a high level, uh, in-house counsel should be aware of, again, the need to have policies around the moderation of a social media presence, if there is, in fact, to be any moderation at all, and to set clear parameters around what is or what is not appropriate use, and then to ensure that those policies are being complied with by the individuals responsible for maintaining the social media presence. Now another risk is essentially the flip, flip side of this, which arises when someone else posts defamatory, abusive, private, confidential, or copyrighted content pertaining to your company, but posts it somewhere else, on some other, on a social media site, or on another a website, and this may, for example, create obligations to your employees if, for example, their personal information is being uh, posted 
posted publicly. Um, it may, if you're not legally obligated to take action, it may be in your interest to do so, to have the, to have the content taken down. That, of course, uh, is tricky. Uh, again, in large part due to the anonymity of the internet and the ability of individuals to post this kind of content on sites while remaining uh, anonymous. And asking the site that is hosting this content to take it down may make them concerned about their risks if they start engaging in moderation of content, just as you may very well be concerned about moderating content on your own social media presence. And then, of course, layered on top of this is whether you should do anything at all, at least um, if you're not legally obligated to do so. And to illustrate this point, we have a case study uh, involving a law firm that was quite upset to receive a negative review on, on, um, uh, on a review site and actually took the step of suing for defamation over this negative review. Now, ultimately, uh, the poster, whoever it was, didn't defend the claim, and so the law firm proceeded in default and went to a hearing where the judge uh, treated the allegations as being admitted, and the question was the level of damages that should be assessed in favor of the law firm. And here this illustrates precisely why sometimes it isn't advisable to pursue your legal rights even if you have a, even if you have a claim because the court was quite unimpressed with the claim that had been brought actually saying in my view this action should never have been brought and awarding a mere one dollar in nominal damages to the law firm and this illustrates precisely why a response that is too heavy-handed is often inadvisable. So now we've talked about many of the risks and there are, are others and uh, Sonia and Sven are going to talk about uh, some of the other risks and considerations associated with social media. I am going to talk briefly about the issue of taking legal action uh, with any issue uh, arising from uh, a social media risk and the kinds of questions that you as, as in-house counsel uh, should have in mind but for advising uh, the company on whether or not to proceed. And uh, again, first, one of the things to consider is whether you need to go to court at all. Uh, often people leap to the conclusion that going to court is their only remedy. Uh, there are other options, one of which uh, is to do nothing, but also another option is to consider using the appropriate use procedures and policies that are referred to others that are maintained by major social media platforms. Now, of course, if you are going to sue, you have to figure out whether or not you can identify the person that you're going to take action against. And sometimes this is a very difficult question, as I've alluded to, and it may require um, preliminary legal proceedings just to identify the person that is going to be the target of the litigation, which is necessarily going to increase the complexity, uh, the time, and the cost associated with legal action. But then beyond that, you have to consider how is legal action going to affect the perception of your organization? Are you going to look like a bully? Are you going to look like you're too sensitive? Are you going to simply attract more attention to whatever it is on social media that you're concerned with? Just to illustrate this, often, often demand letters that are sent to individuals who have posted content on social media or otherwise on the internet are posted by the recipients. They take the demand letter, post it online, and frame themselves as being bullied or threatened by a big, a big company or brand. And doing so risks simply attracting more attention to whatever it is that this person said or did that prompted the letter. So often Taking action can make the problem worse. Now, there are ways uh, to address this. Um, um, if one is to set, a, uh, if you are going to send a letter, it's important to consider the language and the tone of that letter, uh, anticipating, perhaps assuming that it's going to be posted online. 
And sometimes companies have been created and written demand letters uh, that don't follow the typical uh, aggressive legal demand pattern and perhaps empathize with the recipient or take a joking tone with the recipient, something that is going to take uh, the sting out of the letter if it is posted online. I also need to consider whether there's any need to, or how much need there is to detail the specifics of the allegations. Again, because the letter might itself become public, it may itself be circulated. Uh, putting too much detail in the letter uh, risks spreading whatever it was uh, that was a problem that prompted the letter in the first place. Uh, another consideration, of course, is where, uh, to the extent there is uh, so-called anti-slap legislation in place. So this is an uh, acronym uh, referring to strategic lawsuits against public participation. Lawsuit, this is legislation that is intended to prevent parties from using lawsuits, whether it's defamation lawsuits or otherwise, from shutting down public debate. And the these uh, statutes in the jurisdictions where they exist can make it very difficult to bring uh, lawsuits where there is an argument uh, that commentary, be it on social media or otherwise, relates to a matter of public debate. So again, very much need to consider the merits of litigation and the potential for an anti-slap defense to be raised before deciding whether or not to take any sort of legal action. Um, and as we've noted, leaving aside the existence of such legislation, the courts in general are not particularly sympathetic to overly sensitive companies, not simply overly sensitive law firms. And so even though you may be able to bring litigation, you should be asking the question of whether or not you should. So ultimately, uh, addressing social media risks is going to require an approach that is not purely legal. It will necessarily require the advice of legal counsel so that the business has the full picture of the issues and the potential options available to them. And this is a, this is a theme that my colleague Sonia and Sven are going to be returning to. So I'm going to pass things over to Sonia as she talks about social media crisis involving public allegations of wrongdoing. Thanks, Evan. So it may be that your company finds itself in the unfortunate situation of being on the other end of litigation or potential litigation, um, which is another risk that we have seen emerge in recent years. Uh, and that's really the, the use of social media as a mechanism to make public complaints about wrongdoing. The public allegations of misconduct can be against the company more generally, its culture, senior executives, or specific employees. And the allegations can range anywhere from financial misconduct, uh, sexual harassment, racism, or other forms of misconduct. We've seen examples in the news of executives uh, being accused of serious wrongdoing online and the colossal effects that that can have on both the individual's reputation and also the company's. And so when we look at the types of allegations that are made and spread on social media about companies, um, a trend emerges that it really often goes to the culture um, or values of the company. So even though the allegations may start with one issue or a specific com uh, complaint, they are often broadened to be about, uh, for example, the whole company lacking diversity, uh, being culturally insensitive, or having the type of culture where sexual harassment can take place. There's also often a domino effect in social media where one public allegation of a specific incident leads to hundreds or thousands of comments or other people coming forward and making similar allegations. And so this contributes to the broadening effect of a particular complaint that's made. The public nature of the allegations and the speed at which the online dis discussion moves really expedites the timeline for the company in responding to it and increases some of the risks, which we'll talk about. So to give sort of broad examples of the potential risks, they include lawsuits against the company, which can include regulatory action, um, individual lawsuits or class actions. 
And there's also risks relating to uh, PR crises or HR issues. And the two I'll talk about in particular is the heightened risk of regulatory proceedings and class actions. In regulatory matters, uh, companies dealing with this type of allegation don't have the luxury of an internal whistleblower complaint where they can conduct an internal confidential investigation, assess whether they need to report, and then do remediation to deal with any issues internally in the company. Instead, in the case of a public allegation, uh, regardless of the, mark, uh, the, the merit of the claim, uh, it can bring, the public nature of the allegation can bring um, regulators knocking on the door who feel they have an obligation to investigate, depending, of course, on the seriousness of the conduct. There's also a heightened risk that class action, um, there's also a heightened risk of class actions because of the ability for the complaint to be seen by a large number of people uh, who can then come forward. This type of grassroots crowdsourcing of other people who feel aggrieved is a unique feature of the social media era. Perhaps the best examples of these risks is demonstrated by the Me Too related allegations in the last year. Um, we all know the Me Too hashtag went viral on Twitter last year and then spread to other social media platforms. And a useful case study to look at just as, as an example is um, the, the first uh, major company crises in the Me Too movement, which was the Weinstein Company and, and Harvey Weinstein, which began last year. So to illustrate the, the fast nature of this type of crises, uh, we'll just quickly go through the timeline of what happened. On October 5th, 2017, the New York Times published an article claiming that film producer Harvey Weinstein had paid off sexual harassment accusers for decades. And, you know, as a side note, many other high profile cases of sexual assault have um, come out in news and going back decades. But what made this situation unique? Well, it's what happened immediately after the news article. There was a social media storm that followed and really an immediate uh, social media reaction. Only a few hours after the Times published its, its report, uh, Weinstein issued an apology and people began taking sides, including celebrities, some going so far as to defend him and others going on the other side. In the following days, there was a plethora of news articles um, online articles and social media storms about the issue. On October 8th, which is only three days um, after, there was an announcement that Weinstein, uh, Harvey Weinstein was fired from the Weinstein Company, which is the company he co-founded. And then two days later on October 10th, uh, there was an announcement by Weinstein's personal PR consultant that any allegations of non-sexual sex are unequivocally denied by Mr. Weinstein. Five days later, on October 5th, uh, an actress, Alyssa Milano, used the hashtag MeToo and urged victims of sexual abuse to share their stories on Twitter. And this is seen as the, the, the 2017 beginning of the, the MeToo uh, hashtag. There was an, a ripple effect minutes, hours after that post on October 15th. Uh, where first dozens and then hundreds and thousands of uh, people began commenting and reports about uh, Weinstein um, allegations, uh, not, not just to get about Harvey Weinstein, but also against countless other celebrities, people in the, in the media industry. Mostly the entertainment industry, but also against politicians as well in those early days. It broadened, uh, and this is where we see the, the ripple effect of social media broadening, where at the beginning it was focused on the entertainment industry, but then began to um, broaden to other industries as well. And recently I read a report that the Me Too hashtag has been used more than 19 million times on Twitter from the date of that October 5th tweet, October 15th tweet uh, to September of this year, so in, in less than one year, 19 million uses of the tweet. So if your company finds itself in this type of crises or uh, another 
social media risk that starts to emerge into a crisis, it's really important to consider the role of legal in that as well as PR. And one of the um, early decisions that uh, in-house counsel will need to make is whether to retain external counsel. This will depend on a number of factors, including the seriousness of the issue, whether certain expertise is required that isn't available in-house, privilege considerations, and the level of risk overall. If external counsel is retained, they can assist with deciding whether it would be appropriate to engage a PR consultant. And because of the intersection of reputational and legal risks in social media, the coordination of legal and PR is very important. There are cases where a PR consultant will be retained proactively before a crisis erupts, uh, and this is the ideal situation in anticipation of an issue where uh, you can prepare a readiness plan with the HR consult with a PR consultant. Um, they can help assess the risk and draft possible communications or press releases for different scenarios. But then there are other scenarios where that's not possible. The issue is unforeseen, and so a PR consultant may be engaged in reaction to a social media crisis. And in either case, it's important to ensure that the manner in which the PR consultant is retained and the communications that take place with legal are protected by privilege. So uh, one example or one best practice is the retainer letter that's used for the PR consultant should have clear confidentiality provisions and a protocol for communications that really articulate that the PR person is an advisor that is assisting with the provision of legal advice or in providing advice in anticipation of potential litigation. Um, if the PR consultant is going to be working with legal, that is, it's very important to protect privilege in those scenarios. It's also important to define at the outset the roles of legal counsel and PR um, so that the strategy that is undertaken is a coordinated front. And again, the importance of coordination between PR and legal cannot be overstated. Uh, this can be a tricky relationship because there may be situations where the legal risks and the reputational risks seem conflicting or like they're on two different tracks. Um, for instance, there are cases where legal thinks that a certain approach is the most prudent, you know, legal course, um, but it would have negative PR implications. And so there can be a dance here between legal and PR finding the optimum strategy. The way to navigate this relationship uh, is with continuous communication and the recognition that PR and legal are complementary roles. And the solution is really towards developing a strategy that manages both the legal and reputational risks effectively. And so we've put here on the slide some of the um, main tasks or roles of PR. Um, obviously, developing a clear, clear PR and communication strategy is one of the primary roles of PR and really where they're well suited. Um, assessing the reputational risk. Uh, both proactive or reactive. Um, also, PR can be very helpful in assisting with communications with the complainant, if there are going to be any communications, and with other stakeholders. And in fact, developing a communication plan is at the outset is advisable. As well, um, PR is instrumental in drafting a press release along with consulting with legal and advising on the response strategy and messaging. Uh, some of those roles overlap or are quite complementary to the legal counsel role. Uh, but legal counsel, of course, its primary role in a crisis is to advise on the legal risks, any regulatory matters, disclosure issues, contractual obligations, or other legal issues that arise. And legal is also well placed to coordinate among the various consultants, including with PR. Um, and to coordinate the overall strategic advice, really the big picture strategy. Legal counsel is also important in ensuring that privilege is uh, maintained. Uh, because of the dual hat that in-house counsel plays in its business um, and the correspondence it may have within the business, it 
it's more difficult to maintain privilege in certain situations because you it would really only be the communications that relate to the provision of legal advice. And this is where external counsel can be quite helpful when you do have, for example, a privileged investigation or a privileged response strategy. Having external counsel involved will protect the confidentiality of those communications and documents. Legal counsel um, can also be quite helpful in reviewing the policies and procedures if that is part of the crisis plan or response plan. Also, it may be appropriate to conduct an investigation. Um, we've talked about public allegations of wrongdoing, and it may be that when a public allegation is made on social media that's quite serious and the company has never looked at the issue, that it would be appropriate to conduct an internal investigation to see whether the allegations have any merit. And external legal counsel is well placed to run that kind of investigation, and some in-house counsel teams as well. Um, are quite uh, well equipped to do that. Uh, legal counsel should also be involved in developing the communications and response strategy, as well as in developing a remediation plan, um, which may include, for example, updating policies, recommending disciplinary measures, or training or coaching employees and executives if necessary, uh, which segues quite nicely, I think, into uh, Sven's part of this webinar. So I'll turn it over to you, Sven. Thanks, Sonia. We've heard a lot uh, thus far about the unique nature of social media risks, as well as the various steps companies can take to mitigate uh, uh, crises um, from uh, social media. And much of the discussion thus far has been external looking, um, how social media is used to either create or amplify a, a crisis. And as an employment lawyer, I'm going to focus more on internal considerations uh, for uh, the legal department and the multitude of ways in which social media interacts with the employment relationship and workplace laws. I've set out in the uh, slide uh, a few of those ways, whether it's corporate social media use and issues there that arise in terms of branding and ownership, who owns a particular tweet or, or social media message, uh, particularly when you're dealing with uh, outside influencers, as Evan discussed. Um, personal social media use, uh, the situations in which the company can and should discipline employees for social media use, uh, while at the same time uh, considering freedom of speech uh, issues and, and um, censorship. Um, increasingly, we've seen social media as an alternative means of background checks in addition to the more traditional means. People often uh, check up on potential new hires uh, through, through their social media presence and the various issues that arise from doing so. Uh, obviously, social media and company equipment, people, uh, employees using social media to access Facebook, for example, during work hours, social media and employee privacy, and a very hot topic, and um, as both Evan and Sonia mentioned, social media and confidential or proprietary information, lots of areas in which social media intersects with um, the workplace and workplace laws. And so what's the solution or how do you deal with these uh, various um, ways in which social media intersects with the, the employment relationship? The answer is to develop a detailed and thoughtful and tailored social media policy. Unlike a harassment or workplace violence policy, which is often a one size fits all, thou shalt not harass, thou shalt not engage in workplace violence, social media policies need to be tailored to the company's particular situation, uh, their risk profile, their activities and they perform, uh, and the uh, nature of the business. And what kind of considerations go into tailoring a thoughtful social media policy? Well, at the outset, defining what you mean by social media and the permissive and non-permitted uses of social media is extremely important. Many different people have claimed to coin the term social media, and it's never entirely clear what it means or in what context. So in order for a policy to be effective, you need to be clear about what you're talking about. Obviously, social networking sites are social media, but the uses uh, of social networking sites might differ. Um, LinkedIn, for example, is something that a lot of employers encourage their employees to use, whereas Facebook is a much more uh, personal uh, social networking site. Uh, video and photo sharing sites um, raise their own issues, as uh, Evan has talked about, particularly when dealing with influencers. Um, logs, uh, web logs, uh, so whether it's a corporate blog or a uh, personal blog, can have lots of intersections uh, with the workplace and things that are posted on there. We've seen uh, uh, Evan talk about examples 
uh, when it comes to uh, reviews and astroturfing and the, uh, com how even the Competition Bureau can get involved um, in, in that respect, and um, messaging sites, uh, whether it's uh, forums or discussion boards or uh, WhatsApp and WeChat, increasingly we know that employees use these to communicate with each other both personally and about uh, workplace issues. And on the one hand, it enhances and um, simplifies in many ways communication, uh, allowing employees to work more effectively and efficiently. And on the other hand, you have corporate information and documentation and sensitive information being used on platforms uh, and servers not controlled by the company. So there's a lot of uh, consideration that needs to go into simply identifying in the first place what you mean by social media. Uh, additional considerations for drafting a, a careful and thoughtful uh, social media policy. Uh, at a fundamental level, distinguishing between corporate use and personal use. Uh, we'll drill down on this uh, a little later, but obviously corporate use uh, is often individuals uh, who are dedicated with individual accounts, but who uh, is entitled to use it? Who is entitled to speak on behalf of the corporation in public-facing uh, social media posts? And in what context, what authorities or permissions need to be obtained? And contrast that with personal social media use. Where is it appropriate for an employer to draw the line uh, in terms of personal social media use, both in the workplace and outside of the workplace? Because there are situations where um, employers do have a legitimate business interest in regulating employee, co employee social media use, even outside of working hours. Another uh, important point in drafting a uh, effective and uh, tailored social media policy is to ensure that it works with your other uh, workplace policies. And I've said this many times to clients, the only thing worse than not having uh, a social media policy in place is having a policy that contradicts your other policies. Because in those situations, the policy is really worth the paper it's written on. So many, uh, most uh, sophisticated businesses at this point would have a code of business conduct or an in integrity and compliance policy setting out certain ethical standards of behavior. You'll want to make sure that your social media policy um, works with this policy as, as well. Confidential information or data privacy policies and agreements are increasingly common, uh, particularly in, in jurisdictions that have uh, private sector uh, privacy legislation. So uh, the and consent-based regimes, you'll want to ensure that your social media policy, again, works hand in glove with those policies. Obviously, um, IT and computer use policy, uh, it wouldn't make any sense to have a social media policy uh, that uh, prohibits outright any personal use of social media while having an IT or computer use policy that does allow employees to use um, their computers and IT during breaks, for example. Um, so external communications and media policies, um, who's entitled to speak on behalf of the company, how are complaints handled, that's something that should be addressed uh, as well in the social media policy and uh, more obvious policies such as handheld device policies or workplace violence and discrimination policies. Um, those also need to work with your social media policy. So once you've turned your mind to the various considerations that go into drafting a proper um, policy and the framework, you'll want to focus on the, obviously the content. As with any workplace policy, the who is an important question. Define the scope and applicability. Many of our clients with cross-border operations prefer, you know, the fewer policies, the better to judge. But there are difference, differences in the legal regimes in Canada and the U.S. That means a, a one-size-fits-all policy is not necessarily going to be appropriate. Um, other uh, important points to bear in mind when considering the uh, scope uh, and the content of your social media policy is when you are talking about non-business use, how are you going to ensure that not only it makes sense from a, a corporate and a legal risk perspective, but in practice? How are you going to enforce the, the, the policy? If it's widely known that employees regularly use social media um, throughout the day in the workplace, having a policy that prohibits um, social media in the workplace isn't going to be uh, something that a company can rely upon if it doesn't take steps to enforce it. If management knows of the policy and allows employees to act in blatant violation of it, then the policy itself uh, won't be something the company can rely on if it seeks to take action against employees. So ensure that you de develop a policy that's um, common sense and uh, enforceable in, in real life. 
Um, another important point, obviously, is going to be consistency of enforcement. Uh, as with any workplace policy, a policy that is not enforced consistently that demonstrates favoritism is highly problematic, whether it's uh, the risk of discrimination or reprisal complaints or something as more fundamental as employee unhappiness leading to, as we know, unionization um, is one of the uh, number one results of in inconsistent management action. So ensure that there is enforcement and ensure that there's consistent enforcement and how are you going to define limitations? When you're dealing with uh, something as nebulous as social media policies, how to say how much is too much um, is going to be an important line to draw and one that will have to be carefully drawn by uh, uh, companies based on their own specific circumstances. Additional considerations for the content of your social media policy, obviously the legal framework in which you're operating, um, the protection uh, of freedom of speech and the risks associated with censorship. Uh, Evan raised the examples of uh, companies that moderate comments on their social media pages and the host of issues that that raises. Um, from a labor and employment perspective, there are labor law considerations and the right to associate that gets um, triggered in terms of any uh, prohibitions on employees being critical about terms and conditions of employment can uh, raise uh, problems under labor laws uh, which uh, grant protections to employees to associate and to unionize uh, in respect of terms and conditions of employment. Uh, workplace harassment laws is another example. Uh, one that's not up on the slides but is an extremely important example is overtime laws and, and, and hours of work laws. If an employer encourages its employees to use social media, particularly for business purposes outside of regular business hours, is the employer thereby um, encouraging or condoning work outside of uh, business hours? And is the employee, even if a salaried employee, um, eligible for overtime uh, under the applicable regime? Because as our listeners no doubt know, the uh, exemptions from uh, overtime uh, are narrowly interpreted in all jurisdictions across Canada. Um, Further considerations for social media policies, um, being very explicit, painfully explicit in terms of uh, employees' expectations of privacy, essentially, um, depending on your uh, company equipment and IT policy, most companies' uh, position at this point is that employees have no reasonable expectation of privacy and they'll want to say that explicitly. And the monitoring, you'll want to be explicit in what, if any, monitoring the company does, whether proactively or after incidents in respect of company equipment including uh, on social media. The meat of any uh, social media policy is uh, often um, setting out the permitted as well as and especially the uh, prohibited conduct when it comes to social media. Some of it is very easy to define when you're talking about, for example, intellectual property laws, unauthorized use of IP, violation of other companies' IP, unauthorized disclosure of confidential or proprietary information. That's easy, that's gonna be prohibited. Other um, commonplace prohibitions in social media policies um, include using company assets, computers um, for outsized business purposes, or posting, um, viewing, linking, et cetera, using social media in respect of inappropriate materials, whether it's profane, defamatory, harassing, et cetera. Trickier areas, but where uh, many employers struggle, are the extent uh, to which, if any, uh, you'll want to regulate or provide even guidelines relating to more sensitive uh, areas such as politics, religion, and, and morality. And we've seen uh, a variety of approaches uh, from a variety of different businesses on these uh, areas. Now drilling down a little bit into the various types of use uh, and when you're defining your social media policy, even within the business use, there's going to be internal business use. What is appropriate uh, social media use? Are you allowed to use WhatsApp for uh, internal communications? And external business use. What is the corporate presence on social media? Who's entitled to uh, speak uh, on behalf of uh, the company and in what context and what approvals uh, are required? There are uh, a number of cases out there where there, is, there are disputes over the ownership of a post or a tweet or an image. A paid influencer uh, is uh, producing content for a company uh, in the absence of a clear agreement as to who owns that content. Um, it's uh, obvious that there is the potential for dispute. So uh, legal departments are well served by ensuring that their policies as well as their agreements 
under these policies clearly address uh, issues such as um, the ownership and the approvals required. Other um, important topics, how is this going to be used and stored? Passwords, how are you going to ensure that if something happens to a key social account, you'll be in a position to uh, maintain the presence uh, if you've got uh, password protections and other um, things in place? And obviously training. Increasingly, we know that companies encourage uh, social media use by their employees, um, but uh, there's a way to do it properly. And um, the uh, training on the proper use of social media, particularly external facing social media, is extremely important. When it comes to the other side of the coin, the inside social media use, uh, and sorry, the, the, the personal social media use, um, the key question for employers is the extent to which, if any, they wish to regulate um, off-duty conduct. Obviously, there's going to be, during working hours, some prohibited use or some limitations on the use of uh, social media in the workplace. What about outside of the workplace? On the one hand, um, employers generally don't have a legitimate business interest in regulating off-duty conduct. On the other hand, what is said outside of working hours on social media can absolutely expand and explode and affect the business, and there is a uh, potential for a real nexus to the workplace, and legitimate company interests can be uh, engaged, um, depending, uh, it, more or less depending on the nature of the business. So that is an area that's rife with disputes and needs to be handled carefully. Profiles, particularly profiles for very prominent uh, faces of the organization. What, if any, disclaimers are you going to require um, that the uh, contents of social media are for them personally and not the views of the business? Um, what, if any, prohibitions are you going to have uh, or requirements or, or caveats if any employees um, make reference to the company, its products, its services, or employees on social media? and uh, general guidelines in terms of the responsible use of social media, whether at the company or, or on personal time. These are all considerations that uh, in-house legal counsel will want to work with closely from the business and the marketing side as well to understand we want to maximize the potential of uh, social media and ensure it is used to our benefit as an organization while at the same time minimizing the risks. Last point on social media policies, um, as in all policies, again, they're worth the paper they're written on um, from an enforcement perspective. If you can't prove that the employee has been made aware of and uh, agreed to be bound by the policies. For new hires, that's a relatively easy process. Most uh, organizations, uh, sophisticated organizations, have an onboarding process where they make employees avail, uh, aware of their policies. Cross-referencing policies, not necessarily social media um, specifically, but a general obligation to comply with policies in the employment contract is always a good thing. But specific uh, sharing of policies as part of the onboarding process and sign backs, very important. Um, for existing employees, um, there needs to be a rollout, particularly if you don't have a social media policy or if you're doing a significant refresh and update of your social media policy, how to ensure that existing employees are aware of and have an opportunity to ask questions in respect of, and then finally are bound by those policies is important, and that's done through um, a, a, an efficient rollout uh, and uh, a, a tailored process. Obviously, um, policies, if you've rolled it out three years ago, are not going to be top of mind, so it's going to be important to educate the employees on the use of social media, how to bring it to their attention, whether through training sessions or postings in the workplace, the more often um, the radio principal prize, the more often you bring it to their attention, the more likely they are to comply with it. And um, organizations at this point know that it's a good idea to have at least an annual refresh and sign off um, by employees of their important policies. And I would uh, very much argue that for many organizations, social media policies should be one of those. And uh, as a former uh, high school teacher, I do feel compelled to note that the more effective the training, the more likely the compliance. And so social media is really an area in which there are real life examples that can really hammer home the importance of complying with the policy. So use real life events and case studies for training purposes to ensure that um, the, the uh, impact of, um, of non-compliance is brought home to the employees. So in the end, social media, uh, as you've heard, is increasingly pervasive and important. 
companies need to keep up with it. And a good starting place, at least from the workplace and internal perspective, is a thoughtful uh, social media policy that's tailored to the company's uh, particular business. Of course, we'd be happy to assist uh, any businesses in doing so to ensure that there's a policy in place that helps maximize social media's potential while minimizing uh, the legal risks. Evan? All right, thank you very much to our presenters. Uh, we already have a couple of questions rolling in. Um, the first question is going to be for Sonia. Um, it relates to engaging counsel uh, to respond to social media crises. Specifically, when do you recommend that uh, legal counsel be engaged to assist with developing a response to a social media crisis? And is there a tipping point uh, when legal counsel should be engaged? Well, that's a great question. and. Um you know, I, I wish there was a simple, simple uh, answer to that, but it, it's kind of a multi-factor answer. So I think internally, in-house counsel should be engaged as early as possible to assess the potential legal risks and to determine at the outset whether this is an issue that legal should be involved in. Um, when it comes to deciding whether to retain external counsel, Again, it will really depend on the fact and the level, um, the level of risk and expertise involved. So generally, some guideposts are that it would be advisable to retain external counsel in high-risk matters. Um, so this is where there's a significant litigation risk if the issue involves senior executives or allegations about the company culture. That would be high-risk matters or regulatory issues. Um, Another, other scenarios where retain, retaining external counsel would be very useful is if an internal, internal investigation needs to be conducted, if substantive policies need to be revisited, um, if a company, for example, doesn't have a social media policy and has significant social media uh, exposure, um, external counsel can help with that. Um, also, if the situation calls for specific social media or employment law or risk expertise that the in-house counsel team either doesn't feel like they have or they just don't feel particularly comfortable with, um, external counsel uh, can, can be uh, used for their expertise. So I think a good litmus test is if it seems like there may be some material risk and you are unsure, then retain external counsel to get advice. This really is a situation where it pays to be proactive. Thanks very much. That's very helpful. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, we're going to respond to the other questions that have been posed offline. But on behalf of Sven, Sonia, and Evan, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. We hope it has given you some useful insights. Make sure you join us for the remainder of the webinars in this series. More details will be posted on osler.com in the near future. Thank you again for attending this webinar, and have a lovely day.